Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we open our study today, as we open our conversation and discussion about what we are about to read, let us seek our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction. Help us now, Father, in all things. Direct us in that that you would have us to do. But now let us join together to seek his wisdom so that we may more clearly understand this which we need to understand today for the times in which we are living. Will you now join with me in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we come before you now in need of your wisdom and your guidance. We thank you, Father, for these opportunities that we have so that we may be cleansed, made white, and justified before you. Please forgive us of our sins. Direct us now and show us, Father, that that you would have us to do. I thank you, Father, for those that are where we are joining together today. We need you, Father, in all things and in all ways. I thank you for those that will view this later on the Internet. We ask, Father, for your blessing and your direction. May your angels attend us. May your spirit guide us and open our minds so that we may have this conversation to be able to understand all that you would have us to know. Help us now, Father, in all ways and in all things, to be prepared to do the work that you would set before us. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we left this study last week. This admonition that is before us is fairly telling. And then we're going to get into the portion that we did not enter into, but we addressed briefly. Now, just just so you are aware, at this point, um, last week, I had to take my mother Saturday night to the hospital. While she is home, she is very weak, and I may be interrupted during this study. And if that is the case, I apologize. But we're going to have this conversation because this is something that we need at this time. God holds men responsible for obtaining a knowledge of him and of Jesus Christ, whom he hath sent. Is this statement important for us today? How do you how do you see this statement and how do you respond to this statement? I take it exactly as it says. So what does it mean to you, sister? Well, if it's plain God holds men, he's talking about all she's talking about all of us, all mankind. I mean, if they don't know his word, they can learn that there there is there is a maker and a sustainer throughout nature. There are things that cannot be explained except there must be some amazing being that's keeping everything going and is watching over everything. I mean, as a heathen Catholic, whatever, I I knew there had to be something supreme that I could not comprehend and I didn't want to accept at that time. My poetry that I wrote when I was really young proves that. So I believe that everybody who has a mind that's functioning properly can can, uh, perceive that there's something beyond our senses. And I, when I was 15, I vowed, I remember standing up in Catholic, in Catholic school and I was saying, I don't believe in the God that you're, that you're telling me that this kind of God and this creed is for me, but I step so pro veritate. I stand for truth and I'm going to, I'm determined to find it. So God took me seriously then and long, long circuitous route finally came to Christ, right? And I believe that everybody who is really looking for truth is going to find it. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So ultimately, these people will come to Christ. It's a good testimony. But I'm going to ask this, I'm going to ask this question in this way. Is it the responsibility of man to rely upon a priest for the knowledge of God? No, (laughs) especially what I was seeing and hearing about the priests. Is it the responsibility of man to rely upon a minister to obtain a knowledge of Christ? Come to Christ directly. You can't depend on man. You can't depend on yourself. Well put. In the prayer of Christ just prior to his crucifixion, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son may also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, 
that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, 1 to 3. What a saying is this? How full, how deep, how comprehensive. She follows it with the statement that there is no excuse for those who persist in remaining in ignorance of God and of Jesus Christ. How many times are there those that decide that they don't need a personal relationship with Christ, that all they need is their membership in a church or to follow a specific speaker? This tells us much. We covered part of this last week. Now, we're going to go forward and address the next portion. Okay, hang on for a second. Yes. Now, the next, the next portion of this, last week, we come to a Review and Herald article from May 21st, 1895. Now, as we were addressing this, this was published on the 25th day of the second month of the biblical year, 5940. Now, there had been a statement from last week's chat about this situation. So if we are using these numbers, if we're looking at this correctly, what does this tell us at this time? What is, what's the square root of some of this that we're going to look at now? Do we have an idea? Square root of which? Well, last, last week in, in the chat, we had it pointed out as to what the square root was for what we were looking at here. I, I remember it being posted. I just don't remember what it was said. I don't remember either. Okay. Okay. So that was last, last Sabbath, you're saying? Correct. Yep. Okay. So the square root. Oh, yes, there it is. It was 77.071395. So we have both 777 of Lamech, and we have the 391.5, all of those digits involved in this at this time. Does that offer us anything for our consideration? Well, it just points to the significance of this uh, statement. Right. And this article. Now, this article is available to all. You can look this up in, on the Ellen White CD-ROM. You can look this up online. But we're going to cover this because this, this portion had huge significance to me as I was being led to research Ezekiel 9. The directions that Moses gave concerning the Passover feast are full of significance and have an application to parents and children in this age of the world. Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and upon the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Now, we, we talk quite a bit about the hyssop dipped in blood, striking the lintel and the two side posts. Now, the lintel is what's at the top of the door. But how often do we note that none of you shall go out the door of his house until morning? Is there anything unimportant in the Bible? Is there anything published, presented for our edification in the Bible that we can safely ignore? No. Oh. Thank you, brother. I want you now to listen to this next portion. The father was to act as the priest of the household. 
And if the father was dead, the eldest son living was to perform this solemn act of sprinkling the doorpost with blood. Does it say here that the mother was to do this? It was the father's duty. It is the father's duty. Yes. This is a symbol of the work to be done in every family. Parents are to gather their children into the home and to present Christ before them as their Passover. The father is to dedicate every inmate of his home to God and to do a work that is represented by the feast of the Passover. It is perilous to leave the solemn duty in the hands of others. This peril is well illustrated by an incident that is related concerning a Hebrew family on the night of the Passover. The legend goes that the eldest daughter was sick, but that she was acquainted with the fact that a lamb was to be chosen for every family, and then its blood was to be sprinkled upon the lintel and the side posts of the door, so that the Lord might behold the mark of the blood, and not suffer the destroyer to enter in to smite the firstborn. With what anxiety she saw the evening approach, when the destroying angel was to pass by. She became very restless. She called her father to her side and asked, Have you marked the doorpost with blood? He answered, Yes, I have given directions in regard to the matter. Do not be troubled, for the destroying angel shall not enter here. What did the father just say? I have given directions. I have abdicated my role to someone else. I have left the eternal weight, the eternal judgment that could fall upon my family in the hands of someone else. Now, I've often used this example. There is a man with whom I've had great respect for many years. Several years ago, as a friend was being disfellowshipped, this man stood up in the examination and made the statement, I don't have the time to study. This is for the reason that I rely upon the leaders of the conference. They have the time to study and to tell me what the Bible says. Is this the position we are to take right now, brothers and sisters? Is this the attitude we are to have at this time? No. Far from it. That's very papal. That's what I was taught. We were not allowed, at my time we, when I was younger, we were not allowed to have a Bible. We could bring it, bring a missile or a prayer book or something like that, but no Bible. But my grandmother knew the Bible. Thank God for her because she was in my life. All right. How restless are we today? The night came on. And again and again, the child called her father, still asking, are you sure that the doorpost is marked with blood? Again and again, the father assured her that she needed to have no fear, that a command which involves such consequences would not be neglected by his trustworthy servants. How many examples do we see about servants that are told to tend the vineyards and what what was the outcome of these servants that were tending the vineyards did they do what the landowner required did they not reject those that were sent to them did they not murder those prophets and then When the son of the landowner was sent, what did they do with him? Well, they slew him. And that's why I'm asking for prayer here, because I'm actually dealing with somebody who was demon-possessed. And I've exposed her, and I don't know what the game is going to be next. It's like David in the house of Saul, very, very much. So right now she's in her uh, quote-unquote sane phase, because she has been, been exposed. So if you could just keep in prayer for me, because it's it's very draining. Thank you. Okay. As midnight approached, her pleading voice was heard saying, Father, 
I am not sure. Take me in your arms and let me see the mark for myself so that I can rest. The father conceded to the wishes of his child. He took her in his arms and carried her to the door. But there was no blood mark upon the lintel or on the posts. He trembled with horror as he realized that his home might have become a house of mourning. With his own hands, he seized the hyssop bow and sprinkled the doorpost with blood. He then showed the sick child that the mark was there. The question now, are parents placing the mark of God upon their households in this their day of probation and privilege? Are not many fathers and mothers placing their responsibility into others' hands? Do not many of them think that the minister should take the burden and see to it that their children are converted and that the seal of God is placed upon them? They do not restrict their children's desires, referring them to a thus saith the Lord. Many suppose that the Sabbath school influence will be all sufficient and that the Sabbath school teacher will instruct and educate their children in such a way as to lead them to Christ. Fathers and mothers place their responsibilities in the hands of others, and thus perilously neglect their own households. This passage has had great personal influence upon me, revealing things where I failed in the past. We are dealing with today. We are coming close to the midnight hour. We are coming close to the time of today's midnight cry. Now, as she continued, he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man among them was was clothed with linen, with a writer's inghorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, and come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, the men of responsibility in brackets which were before the house. Where does this judgment begin? At the house of God, the church. We cannot rely in any manner upon mankind to tell us what the Bible says. We cannot be relying upon any minister, any priest, any speaker to tell us what God would have us to know. Should we choose to do this, we are placing our lives in the hands of others. Is this what God wants us to do? Ezekiel Mm -hmm. 9, 7. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. How total is this destruction? How total is this judgment? Who can avoid this? None but the ones who got the mark in their foreheads and the hands. 
Correct, brother. Now, is that is this a mark that we can see? No, it's not. Only God's avenging angel sees this, right? Amen. Yet, I would also have to think that the angels and those unfallen may also be able to see this, because does God does does God not show His wisdom? To those that truly follow him. He shows to them. Well, yes, he does. It also says that Christ will put on the garments of vengeance when he takes off the garments of the high priest. So I don't know at this point how much angels can read our minds and our hearts, but I think that some of them are very aware of much of what is in our hearts and our minds just by observing what we do. Okay. Now, Ezekiel 9, 8 starts a new thought, a new passage. And it came to pass while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Is Ezekiel involved in this vision? Is he involved in this prophecy? Yes, he is. What, what what do you mean he's involved? A, pre, a premise had been has been stated several times that when the prophet is presented as being part of the prophecy, that he's seeing himself in it. I'm not sure what you're referring to here. I'm not isn't this, with that. Isn't this a point that Elder Jeff made several times? Well. What what we have is that when a prophet is seeing something in vision, he's he may not he may act apart. Let's say he may act like he doesn't know what something means, right? Um, and that's part of a symbol. But I'm not sure how you're saying that Ezekiel's part of this prophecy. That's what I'm trying to figure out. So maybe I missed something. I mean, he's seeing this happening, but he's not participating. Well, he's saying here that, and I was left. He's watching while everybody, all all of these other men Mm -hmm. are slaying those that are in the city, in Jerusalem. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I quite grasp what you're saying here. You mean in verse 8? While they were slaying them, and I was left on my face and cried. So he's in the vision, imploring God, like asking God, will thou destroy all, all the re- residue of Israel, etc. So in that, in that case, he is playing a part in the prophecy. Yeah, I don't think that's a good translation of it. I'm not sure what that would even mean. Okay. So I don't, I don't see him as part of this vision in the way that you're describing. So I'm not... I just I'm not quite sure I understand what what you were referring to even with what Jeff was saying because that doesn't sound familiar. Okay. So I just know that you know sometimes they're part of a vision and that they they're but that's not happening here. I mean he's seeing this happening. Right. Right. This idea that I was left. I don't think it's it's that all those people were killed and he's left. I, I'm not not sure what that would mean, but I don't think that it means that, you know, it could mean to just that, um, yeah, because you also have um, this word, our Lord God, that will destroy all the residue of Israel. And you can see that there's a relationship between the word residue, right? Sha'irith and Sha'ar, right? That is, so so there's a relationship there. But I don't think that it's it's um, it's describing him as part of the vision. Well, can I ask a question? If is he is he um, is he in our future or is he in his future, his time period? Oh, he's brought to our time. He's brought to our time, so it's happening yeah, during but, our time. Yeah, it's but it's in vision, right? So I mean, it's represented symbolically. You know, it's a so, what, so what you're saying is he he is saying when he said he says um, Lord, Lord God, wilt thou destroy the residue of Israel in the power 
in the pouring out of the fury upon Jerusalem. Yes. Is he not? Is he not seeing people being slaughtered? Yeah, he is, but he's not. He's not. He's seeing it in vision, right? So he's right. seeing people being slaughtered. We agree with that. I'm just saying that he is not in the vision. So he's That's not true. carried down to our present day. He's seeing in vision symbolically what's going to happen in our time. Okay. All right. So he's not, I'm just, I'm just trying to get it straight in my head. Yeah. I mean, I think what you're referring to Dwight is the idea, for instance, when uh, Daniel is by the banks of the Uli, right? He's being brought into the future at the start of the 2300 days. Right. Being brought to Persia. And he's going to see the start of the 2300 days. So he has, in a sense, he's um, and he's brought into the future, and there are things that he doesn't understand. But I don't know. Can you explain further? Because I'm I'm kind of puzzled by it. Well, I'm I'm trying. One of the points that I'm trying to make. Ellen White was given several visions, especially of what it was going to be like at the time of the end. Mm-hmm. And many times when these prophets are given this type of a vision the vision is is meant more for our time than it is for the time in which they're living right so here is ezekiel he has a vision at the time in which ezekiel 9 was being presented he's being shown the five men with slaughter weapons the man with the inkhorn by his side Mm -hmm. and they are coming to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, we know that literal Jerusalem yet existed. Mm -hmm. But did this prophecy occur literally at that time? Well, um, I would say no. I would agree. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, he's not, he's not describing something in his time. He's describing at the end of time. And and so one of the things it shows us is that what's happening with with these prophecies regarding liter- literal Israel is they're typifying something that's going to happen at the end of the world. Now, I mean, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and so forth, but, but he's not specifically addressing what's coming then. Right. Right. And so, I mean, the idea is, I think... We know he's brought to Jerusalem in vision, right? He's not in Jerusalem. He's in Babylon. Right. So so he's brought into the future to Jerusalem, and he's seen Jerusalem not necessarily as it is literally, like all the things that he sees, the, the image and those things. Those things aren't actually there, right? You know, the images portrayed on the wall and so forth. This is symbolic of something, Right. Right. You know, if you went to Jerusalem at that time, you're not going to see the things that he's seen. So he's seen something in Jerusalem. And that is symbolic of what's going to happen at the end of the world. Right. So this is a prophecy using Jerusalem as an illustration, but it's an end time prophecy. Right. That's how I would understand it. Right. Now, in in this situation, when we go, when when we're reading this, we're seeing that Ezekiel fell upon his face, right? Falling upon the face is representative of what? Is this not representative of humility? Yeah. Who else do we see in the Bible that fell upon their face as situations were occurring before them? John the Revelator. Repeat, please, brother. John the Revelator. John the Revelator. Okay. Daniel does it other places, too. Daniel does it. uh, What what about Moses? Yeah. What about Joshua? Mm -hmm. Why did Moses and Aaron fall upon their face before the congregation of Israel? If we look at at the verses that the translators had used, Numbers 14, 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell upon their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And that's followed by number 16, 4. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Why did this happen? So 
in Numbers 14, 5, the people rebelled and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto him, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore had hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. They're turning their backs on God. They're turning their backs upon the one that had miraculously led them to freedom. They're saying we would rather have a man deal with us before God than we have to deal with God ourselves. Now, in Numbers, Numbers 16, 4, when Moses heard of this, this is the, re- this is the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Men of renown, men that could speak pleasing things, men that could lead others. What is this telling us today? Ezekiel has fallen on his face in abject humility because what's happening all the way around him is people are turning their backs upon God. We would rather be led by idols then follow the word of God. Is this the position that we are to take today? No, sir. We're supposed to follow God, not man. Amen. Ezekiel 9, verse 9. Then he said unto me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. And the land is full of blood, or the land is filled with blood. And the city is full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. How many people today are there that believe that, yeah, there's a God. He created us. He created the world. But he just set us here because he's disinterested. Because he really doesn't care about what's going on. Or that we're some great experiment, and that he's just watching what's happening. Here is the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah. Was the nation of Israel united at the time that Ezekiel was taken into captivity? Well, was what united? Was the nation of Israel united? Well, well, there is no nation of Israel per se. There's just Judah. I mean... It's at long after the dividing of the kingdom and long, long after the end of, of northern Israel. So the answer to the question is, no, they were not united. But yet here in Ezekiel 9.9, 9, 9 verse 9 being a doubling, all of Israel, Israel and Judah have iniquity, which is exceedingly great. So all of the children of Israel are not together in following God. Is this not what we're seeing today within the church and the movement, that we are not together in following God? Yeah, I see that. Here the land is filled with blood, and the city is resting of judgment. They're wrestling. They're not wanting to accept what God's word says. And as for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. What does this mean, recompense their way upon their head? To repayment. Do we want to be repaid for our sins against God? Do we want that to remain upon our heads? Ezekiel 9-11. Of course, there are many in in and around the movement that say that 9-11 means nothing. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had... The inkhorn by his side reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. I have returned the word. A comment in the chat. Falling upon the face before God is the opposite of falling backward, as occurred with Christ's enemies when he died himself, at his, at, when he ID'd himself at his arrest. John 18, 3-6. 
and in Isaiah 28.13, referring to those who refuse to receive, properly interpret, and obey his word. So, falling upon the face before God is the opposite of falling backward. Joshua fell upon his face before God. Moses fell upon his face before God several times. Daniel fell upon his face before God. Where in the Bible do we note of someone falling backwards? What goes Daniel? Yeah. No, not Daniel. <clears throat> if we I are, think it was Isaiah, wasn't it? Well, brothers and sisters, if we were to look in the book of Samuel, we have the example of the high priest, the judge of Israel named Eli, receiving the word that the battle was lost and the ark was taken. And what happened to Eli? He fell back, back and broke his neck. Exactly. Was Eli following the word of God? No, he was catering catering to his sons. Would we say that he was true to God or was he apostate? Well, he's wishy-washy. <laughs> okay. Does God allow us to be wishy-washy? No. Are we to straddle the fence where God is concerned? Um, Dwight. <clears throat> sure. In um, Isaiah 28, in verse um, 13, I think it is, it talks about falling backwards, too. It says, falling backwards. It says, but the word of the Lord was unto me, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here, a little and there a little, that, we, that they may go and fall backwards and be broken and snared and taken. Okay, so if we fall backward and we are broken and we are snared and we are taken, is that a positive for us? That sounds like a positive there. Okay, any other thoughts? I wouldn't, I, I don't know if it, it's, I think it's when they, when they find out that they have, um, that they have studied the wrong way or done the wrong way, they fall backwards and or be broken and snared and taken. Okay. That's what I would think. I don't know. Um, well, it's a good point. And I appreciate the discussions that we have in these studies. And I want to encourage everyone that we can each present what we are seeing from Scripture, what we find from the Spirit of Prophecy, whenever we are doing these studies. Now, it's interesting, too. When you, when you brought up this with Isaiah 28, 13, the following verse from there, wherefore hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem, because ye have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hid ourselves. In the example of the Passover, the people were to have the father or the eldest son place the blood upon the lintel. They were not to go out of their house. Is this truth or is this a lie? It's true. So are we looking to make a covenant with death? I don't think so. Okay. Proverb eight thirty six keeps coming to my mind, and also that 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 chapter in Isaiah about what's going on here. I mean, these people, especially the woman who's trying to hide herself under a whole flood of lies, and that some of them are current. And I've caught her in many of them, and all she does is deflect, deny, obfuscate, project. And I I said this is what a demon possessed narcissist an extreme narcissist does i've lived with people like you before you know and i said i'm sure you have a pattern going back to your use of deceiving people pretending to be caring pretending to be compassionate pretending to be their friend and fleecing them and absconding with unpaid bills because this is what triggered the whole explosion a few days ago and so 
I'm trying to convince. I told told the executor that if you sell this place to these people, they will run it into the ground. The evidence is already here. And now she's saying, oh, I told Leroy I'm cleaning everything up. Well, it's a little late. Like, I don't claim, I don't claim to be a tidy person myself. But if, if you had come in here and seen the filth and the entire ground. No, I'm not rambling. I'm just giving evidence of what we're facing, Theodore. Yeah, I know. But I, I, I know. I understand. But I just it's not not necessarily relevant, all the details. I right. have to live with this daily, and I've lived with it now for maybe five I, I, months. It's very weary. Okay, I'm, I'll know. shut up. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Now, this last portion from the Spirit of Prophecy, and I'm not trying to skip over the verses that the translators had used, but here we have this. Manuscript 148 from 1899. When a man is filled with the Holy Spirit, the more severely he is tested and tried, the more clearly he proves that he is a true representative of Christ in word, in spirit, and in action. Christ declares, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works that these shall he do, because I go to my Father. John fourteen twelve. What is the promise to every true believer? Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come on to you, Acts 1.8. Might we not better, my brethren and sisters, take ourselves to task for our unlikeness to Christ? He says, you are my witness, Isaiah 43.10. What kind of witnesses are we for truth and righteousness? Are we striving with all our God-given powers to reach the measure or the stature of men and women in Christ? Are we seeking for his fullness, ever reaching higher and higher, trying to attain to the perfection of his character? When God's servants reach this point, they will be sealed in their foreheads. The recording angel will declare, it is done. They will be complete in him whose they are by creation and by redemption. Now from, from the chat, following the Okay, excuse me. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them who believe in the saving of the soul. Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. Now, we've covered quite a bit today. We have addressed these portions that Mrs. White also placed as having to do with Ezekiel 9. God's, when God's servants have reached this point, they become sealed at this moment. I don't know that any are sealed, but I believe the sealing commenced quite a while ago. What kind of character are we revealing? Let us close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you. We ask now, Father, for your blessing and your guidance. Be with Theodore in his presentation today. Be with us each one as we consider what we are doing and how we are representing you. Direct our thoughts, our actions, and all that you would have us to do. Show us now, Father, so that we may learn. Help us so that we may be guided. For this, Father, we thank you, and for we for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.